a new online community and resource for sustainability advocates. Reservoir levels are dropping and heat is rising. World population may peak this decade and start dropping. Should parents vaccinate their teenage children against pregnancy? Should Dave run for president of the U.S.? Over 60 percent of Coloradans are fed up with the negative consequences of growth of their communities. Are they realizing that limited water should mean ending population growth? And yes, Elon Musk keeps populating our conversations and does so again. Next. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters Podcast, where we work tirelessly to make it okay to be against growth. Perpetual growth of the global population and economy is just not possible. And our attempts to break the laws of physics in this regard aren't turning out well. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and founder and chief scientist here at the Institute for Advanced Growth Addiction Studies. And I'm Stephanie Gardner, Growth Busters advisor, environmental law and policy advocate, and sustainable energy buff. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. Well, Stephanie, we address an impressive list of topics in this episode. How did that happen? Well, I think it's because we invited some pretty smart people into the studio for a really great uh, sort of freewheeling conversation. That's right. Professor Paul Sutton from the University of Denver and Professor Chris Bystroff of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, two of the few universities offering a course on human population, are in the neighborhood, so we'll climb into their heads in a few minutes. But first... I want to apologize to you, the listener, for the long wait between episodes. Things just got insane. There were a few things going on in both of our lives, huh, Steph? Yep, just a few things. <laughs> but we're back, and we should be able to keep up the pace the rest of the year with a little bit of luck. Uh, and this is really a perfect segue to our listener feedback section. So I want to jump right into that, Stephanie. I got a phone call. Just a couple days ago, it was from a woman named Judy, and she was really surprised that I answered the phone. She called uh, because she was just wanting to check and make sure that we were okay, because she was missing the Growth Busters podcast. She said, you hadn't published an episode in a while, and I was just worried that something had happened, so I thought I'd better check. Oh, that's really nice. Very, very nice. So thank you, Judy. For your phone call, it made my day. It's nice to know that uh, somebody out there cares. (laughs) Yep, always nice to know that uh, we're not just speaking out into the abyss and folks find the information we're bringing to them, the experts we're bringing to them, good information. Yeah, so without further ado, let's invite Chris and Paul into the studio and have that conversation. Sounds good. I'm pretty excited to be here. sitting here in the Growth Busters studio with three of my all-time favorite people. So we've got Professor Paul Sutton, University of Denver, Department of Geography and Environment. And uh, you do research still in human environment sustainability problems? That's correct. Most valuable, you teach some interesting subjects. Yeah, I teach ecological economics, and I teach population geography, and I teach a class for incoming freshmen called Envisioning Utopia Through the Lens of a Well-Being Economy. And I teach satellite image processing. It's called remote sensing. Well, I'm glad you're still doing that because Paul's. Uh, this is a return engagement. I think you've been on maybe two prior episodes. I think the first time around was when you were here with James Ward back in 2019, episode 26, Running Out of Gas. Yep, I, I was here with James. Yeah, which He's was a funny fellow. That was a fantastic episode. I really enjoyed listening to that one. Yeah, and uh, you know anybody who teaches the subject, you know the courses that you just talked about is going to be a favorite with me, and that's why we are also joined today by Chris Bystroff, who is uh, you're a professor of biological sciences and computer science, and director of the bioinformatics program. Still, oh, I'm now I'm the former director of the former? bioinformatics okay. program. Other than that, you're correct. Okay, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Correct. So, Chris, you're teaching a course on human population. You have been. You're still doing that? Yes, I have. I taught it for the fourth time this spring. And we had you on there as a guest lecturer a few years ago. 
one of the first times I taught it. Yeah, why haven't I been invited back? You will be. But I had Paul <laughs> and I had Nandita and I had two others. So I had lots of invited lecturers this last year. It's been uh, it's getting more popular. Uh, outstanding. And you know what? There's a couple things I want to just share in the in the world of growth busting news. And that's a great segue into the Growth Busters campus tour. And Paul, you may not know about it because you haven't gotten the invitation yet. But what we're doing is we uh, have put together kind of a speakers bureau to make the leading thinkers uh, about limits to growth and uh, and and the truth about sustainability available uh, on college campuses everywhere. Because there's some people that are teaching related courses and want to uh, expose their students to some of this radical thinking, <laughs> but they don't have the, the chops to do it or the experience or the knowledge. And so, the, uh, and I hear that uh, having guest lectures is a pretty popular thing. It sure is. It takes away some of the uh, the, the duties and uh, work of the person organizing the course. And it's great. It's really good to be able to teach in your specialty. So any chance I get, I pull somebody in who can talk right out of their specialty. And so you're off playing golf while your class is in session. Usually I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm guessing that um, campus organizations, student organizations, could also choose to have a, a guest lecture from one of these speakers and self-serve if their faculty aren't necessarily giving them the content that they're most interested in. Yeah, and I'd like to see more of that because what we're trying to do is not just preach to the choir. We want to get the message about uh, true sustainability out there to people who might not otherwise be exposed to it. So uh, so we've put together this Growth Busters campus tour, which is an ongoing thing because we're in the realm now where everybody's used to doing these virtually. So we don't have to worry about the logistics of uh, paying for somebody, to, for a guest lecturer to fly to a campus, although occasionally it yeah, happens, doesn't it? It does. In yes. fact, uh, that's why you're here in the That's studio. That's why I'm with us. here. Paul invited me to give a talk at Denver University. Three I'm very, talks. Very grateful to my university for allowing funds for these kinds of things. I, I think it's a really important part of the university education. It's good for grad students to meet people. Yeah, that's great. So we've basically been putting together a faculty that we're offering to college campuses, student organizations, faculty members, uh, to address their gathering. And Chris, you're already on the faculty, I yeah, think. Yeah, I'm on the faculty. Uh, and Paul, you're kind of like next on my list to reach out to and invite to look at the opportunity and see if you want. I'm happy to play. Yeah, and, and folks can uh, find out more information about the campus tour at growthbusters.org slash campus dash tour. We have a list of all the, the faculty and the topics and I think a contact person and email address so you can reach out for more information. Yep. And uh, I know one of the most recent ones that we got arranged, I know Brian Check from uh, Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy was plugged into a classroom that wanted to have someone come in and talk about some aspect of economics. So back to your introduction, Chris, I kind of got sidetracked, but you've got a couple other things that, that make you interesting to our listeners. Oh, my um, research? Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> give us the Reader's Digest uh, report on that. Reader's Digest uh, report on the contraceptive vaccine. My interest in population manifested itself in my research as a biochemist in uh, creating a new form of contraception. You know, just calling it a, a contraceptive vaccine is the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> yes, it's a vaccine. Yes, it prevents pregnancy. And uh, there's more. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of neat because it's long acting but reversible. Yes, it is. It, we, we're now working on both a long-acting and a medium-long or short-acting contraceptive vaccine. Yeah. And this is still very much in the research phase? or It's in translational research. It's pretty close to going to the next phase, which would be uh, moving to macaque colony, probably a macaque colony somewhere in Oregon. And that leads to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I have to write a report soon and my timeline is looking like we'll be done with this in about 10 years it'll be on the market then then it's all done with all clinical trials and everything 10 oh, years cool. from now yeah oh my it takes gosh. a long time to get things that done. that sounds short to me <laughs> wow and then also you wrote a paper published a paper last year that got That's a right. fair amount of attention yeah that that really is my side kick job the contraceptive vaccine is really my day job i'm paid to do that the thing you're uh, talking about was a paper I put out last year called World 4, something to the effect of peak population is coming soon. And uh, just spoke about that to the colloquium at uh, Paul's University. 
that was my first splash into the field of population modeling. And the executive summary of it is that my model, a systems dynamics model, predicts that peak population will happen within 10 years, and then we'll have something like a collapse. Or not, but uh, maybe a mild collapse. And World 4, of course, is a riff on World 3. We're at the 50-year anniversary of the Limits to Growth, which was published in 1972. And he used the same kind of Stella-based stock flow modeling, correct? Which right. they called World 3. Mm-hmm. So that's not shocking at all that global population may peak in a decade instead of in seven or eight decades, as a lot of people think is going to happen. Right. That's huge. Right. So yeah. what was the reaction uh, or variety of I'm reactions? I'm not sure people give me their honest reaction. I have to kind of read their faces. But I do see some downcast eyes when I talk about that. I don't see it as something devastating and, and uh, I don't see it as something terrible. In fact, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing if population goes down. I see it that way. I really do. I think that human population going down means less of an impact on the planet. That's our goal. I mean, yeah, right? we're all... More affordable housing. You don't have to make reservations in national parks. It, it could be a good thing. Yeah. But you said an, you had an interesting sentence at lunch. Yeah. Can you repeat that sentence for us? Well, so that's what I mean I, when I say I, it doesn't make me sad to talk about population going down. It doesn't scare me. I'm optimistic that population will go down. Now, I use the word crash as kind of, you know, <laughs> To I, get our I, attention. <laughs> just, to, just to zap you, you know. Yeah. But it's, uh, population is not going to crash immediately. It's going to curve slowly and go down. But it's going to go down, in my predictions, much faster than the UN population projections, which suggest that population will have a, a long plateau period and then go down very gradually starting at the end of the century. In my model, it's going to hit bottom at about 2050. Why is that optimistic is what you're asking, right? Well, yeah, because some people are going to worry about how uncomfortable and ugly that bending of the curve might be. Yeah, they would would ask that. Now, I believe in the the studies of Thomas Malthus, who talks about there being a a level of population where you you, population stops at the level of subsistence. He talks about population oscillating. And there's, uh, there's times of happiness and then times of pain, times of misery. Times of misery is when population is above the carrying capacity mm-hmm. and people basically have to cut back. He would say checks kick in and that in- increased disease, increased poverty and uh, overwork, which leads to a higher death rate. And then when you're below the carrying capacity, you're in a time of abundance and you see population curving up. And I think it's possible to be below the carrying capacity curve if we decrease the birth rate. If you decrease the birth rate enough, then you're it's gonna, not you're so gonna, painful. It's not so painful. Malthus talks about this too. And it's the it's the means of population control that is advocated by the moral and good. You decrease the birth rate. Don't bring people into the world if the world is under too much resource pressure, and they're not going to have a good life. So I'm optimistic because I see things going that way. And my contraceptive vaccine is just my little part of adding to the what's already happening, which is a pretty dramatic decrease in the birth rate worldwide. It's not, it's not in particular countries. All countries, it's going down, with the exception of maybe Pakistan. Nigeria. Nigeria, excuse <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. But, but your model actually is, is trained on actual data through 2010. And so this population collapse that his model manifests is not from people dying in war. It's really primarily driven by decreased fertility rates. Am I right? Well, my model is an aggregate model. All means are in there, and it doesn't tell me whether it's war or birth rate. But I have this independent data, which which is the birth rate. So I tend to think it's going to be mostly that. And that makes me Optimistic. Well, that's because we haven't seen a ton of those of the ugly things. We've seen some, but because the model is based on what's really been going on, it hasn't been a complete apocalypse. I think we might be living a slow motion apocalypse right now. But, but Planned Parenthood has made a difference, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, and so. the more of that, the, the better. And you yeah. and you think that's the lion's probably yeah. the lion's share of it. Yeah, I think you're right about it being a gradual apocalypse. And it already started. It, mm-hmm. it started 
early mid 20th century, yeah. I think. And it was things like Planned Parenthood and the rise of uh, birth control pills and such. And the, what that has resulted in is a population growth that has decreased. So population growth rate has been decreasing yeah. over the last 40 years or so. So my model says the downward force on population has been getting stronger over the last 40 years. And projecting that forward, it crosses the line and population, the downward force now overcorrects the upward force. And then we have population going down. And that is, that's fantastic news because the best data we have says we've been in overshoot for over 50 years above the carrying capacity of the planet. And that's why there is so much bad news out there about uh, freshwater, climate disruption, toxification, and uh, what am I forgetting, Stephanie? Oh, there's a long, long yeah. laundry list. Species extinction. <laughs> and, yeah. So it's good news because we have got to contract the scale of the human enterprise, and that's population and or the size of our economy. And we really need to be working on both. We haven't been willing to work very much on the size of the economy. In fact, it's still the number one universal public policy goal to keep growing your goddamn economy. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yep. And there's still a lot of people who think we need to keep growing the population, Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> so we especially need to uh, pursue and celebrate this news. I hope it really happens. It, we need population to peak sooner. The sooner the better. And we need that contraction to happen as fast as possible, preferably not from vast amount of human suffering. But it's going to prevent a lot of human suffering the faster we can get back down to a sustainable level, right? Right. Now, if I could mention a caveat on my model. Okay. It is a business-as-usual model and assumes no policy change. If I could show it to you, you can't plot it on the radio. It would be kind of <clears throat> steep, right? So it goes down to, what, on average about half or, or less of the current population. Business-as-usual model assumes no change in policy. In reality, probably we're, we're going to have a lot of policy changes, in the, and already started some of it. I'm not thinking you're thinking good policy changes. Um, what would the policy changes? One of them would be to preserve the wild spaces of the world. And this, this was something proposed in a book by the late E.O. Wilson called mm -hmm. Half Earth. If you do that, you preserve the ecosystem services of those wild lands. And if you do that, you will have much less of the loss of uh, carrying capacity. You'll be able to preserve the soil, the water, the climate stability that our agricultural systems depend on for a constant and reliable food production. And that is the main source of population decline is basically a loss of agricultural output. You're saying if we were really successful at implementing that policy, then the population decline curve might not be as steep? It might. It would be less steep, yeah. Wow. In the extreme in my models, we can have a stable population of 8 billion. Yeah. But that's an extreme. That's in the, the edges. You know, the main, I think under the half-Earth scenario, ha saving half of all wild biocapacity, it still drops, but it drops to like 5 billion or something. And let's not kid ourselves. That doesn't mean five billion would be a sustainable uh, well, level. You know, His model suggests it is. I, a, I'm not optimistic we could su support five billion. Maybe as a, a giant planetary feedlot for humans and everything's optimized, but I don't think that would be a very resilient system. I don't think it would withstand shocks very well. So, I mean, I, I'm still of the if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else, and we should paint a picture of. Two billion. I'm I'm sort of in the Chris Tucker school. Two to three yeah. billion. Yeah, five with respect billion. Respect to what we should aim for. You'd need a lot of soil and green to feed those five billion. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so should we talk about where we're at now? Which is why I think we're about to hit eight billion on November fifteenth. This one one projection. That's what I've heard. November fifteenth. So, in your model, what is the peak population? Well, in the business as usual model, which ignores, I think, any policy that may be already happening, it, the, the peak was right about now. So mm. what does that say? Well, I just, you know, followed the math and I did the fitting and I assumed that we followed the carrying capacity. I define carrying capacity as a number that you cannot exceed. 
And in fitting the model, the parameters that best fit past data suggested a peak in the very near future, from now to, to about 10 years from now, there will be a peak, and it would be on the order of between 7.5 and, and $8 billion. Mm. So his model, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can't go really that far past carrying capacity, just slight oscillations over it. But carrying capacity is not a fixed number in his model. You can degrade carrying capacity by eating up the biosphere and turning more of it into the humanosphere, mm. right? So he says the carrying capacity, we're using fossil fuels, that's part of our carrying capacity, and carrying capacity will get degraded. Right, so it will go down, and then you will have a lower human population. The way he's chosen to structure his model, there's not an overshoot and collapse kind of thing. The downward trend in the total numbers is a result of degraded carrying capacity. Am I right? Right. It's a. It's based on the concepts of Thomas Malthus that there is a level of subsistence above which you cannot go very far. So all the new pronatalist policies that we've been talking about on the podcast for the last months, years, they're not going to work because we're going to hit the carrying capacity and people are not going to be able to have more kids because there won't be resources for them is sort of the idea. Because when you say there's policy changes, I'm thinking, well, yeah, there's there's tons of policy changes in the wrong direction. So but, what policy yeah, changes but, are you talking yeah. about? You're right. You said it. I was. Uh, those are policy changes in the wrong direction. And if you do that, you exacerbate things. Yeah, You're hitting the wall even harder. So the policy changes in the right directions are, like I mentioned, save the wild, save the ecosystem services, stop cutting the forests, plant trees, things like that, and incentivize. And the, and the human policy side of things, incentivize smaller families. And then you get Carter Dillard on here, and he can tell you about that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess you. we're going to cross our fingers and hope that your data and your curves are correct. That would be awesome because it is pretty pretty bad news. That uh, And I think we'll do another podcast where we'll talk more about this November 15th, hitting the 8 billion oh. mark because that is exactly 11 years, isn't it, from when we hit the 7 billion mark. That's adding a billion in 11 years. And the prior pace was about every 12 years for a couple of billion. Mm -hmm. And – you said it. You said that the population is growing more slowly. Well, if it is, then how come the latest billion was faster than ever? Well, it's because it's a billion. It's a smaller percent of a bigger number. but still way too many people. So it's pretty sad. And that's a good reason to not buy the crap that the uh, United Nations dished out on World Population Day. Let me just say that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Maybe that's enough said. We shared one bit of growth-busting news about the campus tour, but I want to share one other thing that I know we haven't talked about, and that is uh, that we're publicly launching. By the time you're listening to this podcast, it should be out there in public, an online community that we've been in the process of building for several months. And, Chris, you know about it because you've helped us kind of beta test it a little bit. We've decided to create a place online for growth busters from around the world. You're a growth buster if you are advocating or activating for the world to be aware of limits to growth and inspired to do something about it and reduce the scale of the human enterprise, then you're our growth buster. And if you want to uh, go to church with fellow members of that religion or you want to uh, get better at uh, doing that advocacy work, you have some projects maybe that you want to either get help with or you want to contribute to, we've decided we needed to create a place for that. I mean, there's lots of online communities and organizations and forums and stuff, and most of them on these subjects, I think the subjects get almost tucked to death. People are endlessly debating about it because it's hard for us all to agree on much. And we're not creating a place for just more talk. We're trying to create a place where we will together start working on developing a good toolkit to help us do a better job of preaching outside the choir and uh, alerting the world to the true nature of our unsustainable situation today and what we can be doing about it. So we're mentioning it now. There'll be a link in the show notes to where you can go to that community and you can take a little bit of a peek at it. Some of the community you can't really see till you join. I want to join. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I was talking to you about that survey that they did of Colorado voters. We were talking about yeah. lunch about that. I serve on the 
town of Morrison Board of Trustees, and so that allows me to be a member of the Board of Directors of Dr. Cog, and I get to go to these uh, Colorado Municipal League type events, and I went to one, the District 3 of the Colorado Municipal League, and so there are elected officials and town staff from towns all around District 3, and everyone introduced themselves and described the problems their town was facing, and it was a litany that was repeated over and over again. We have traffic problems. We have air quality problems. We have affordable housing problems. And we have water quality and water availability problems. And then they go, and our strategy for addressing these problems is growth. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just shaking my head. And so I stood up. And I stunk up the room. You know, I was like, I ripped one. I said, okay, so... Air quality, water quality and quantity, traffic, affordable housing, all of these things are aggravated by growth. And I swear to God, you could have heard a pin drop when I said that, and they all moved away from me like I was, you know, anathema to something that had been sort of implanted in their amygdala about growth. I don't think they think about it, but when you're saying you're going to give me tools, I didn't feel like I had the next step, you know, mm. how to communicate to these people like – you're zombies. You, you, you don't understand. Your solution is actually going to make things worse. And there's, there's a hostility I get from a lot of people. And then there's a like, just go away. You're weird kind of thing. When I say these kinds of things that this is local government, this, this does make a difference. Um, and so I'm looking forward to your little suite of tools. And if you can come up with rhetorical devices or mechanisms by which I will be more effective at presenting this message, because your, your growth buster story about running for city council, you know more about this than I do. And I it would be very interested in learning from that set of tools. Wow, that's great. Uh, thank you for that, because that's exactly what I want to do. I mean, just imagine if you had been in that meeting and you had had one of our uh, fact sheets that is actually being developed up now with uh, some of the best rebuttals to common myths and critiques of, uh, of sustainable advocacy. We've got several wikis in this group where we're all working, we're all pitching in. So when we find some gem, something that Chris Bystroff said, something really brilliant in class you know, last week, or uh, somebody wrote something really brilliant uh, in a commentary in uh, some scientific journal or something like that. We're stealing the best from here and there and compiling it so that we have that at our fingertips when we're in a meeting or being interviewed on the radio or invited to make a presentation to a class or something like that. So that's just one little example of what I hope to accomplish with Growth Busters online community. Oh, a little bit of hope on that. I, I did get a couple of emails from people that were in the audience that say, you were saying exactly what I was thinking, but I just didn't have the, you know, cojones to say it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think there's a lot of that going on. I think uh, having a, you know, those words would be very helpful. But I admire people like Paul that can go in public and say these things and stink up the room. Because what he's facing is social norms against the message that we're trying to get out. Social yeah. norms are very powerful. They're amygdala. They're automatic. You say something that's weird, something that's outside the normal, there's these negative emotions just get attached to it. How do you get over that? You say it anyway. <laughs> You started yeah. out because yeah, the second time, it's not as bad. The second time, the people that emailed you and told you that they agreed with your position, maybe they'll be brave enough to actually stand up. There, oh, it, it spreads. Oh, yeah. yeah, and they might get me to say it again because I was like, oh, my God, I'm never going to do that again. But the couple <laughs> of emails I got made me a little more – it was it was inspiring, really. Yeah. And that actually kind of underscores the need for this uh, church for people to go to, you know, where you can spend some time hanging out with the choir. You know, you need to spend some time outside the choir and start impacting the process at these uh, public meetings. But you also need to kind of come back and get some affirmation and recognition that you're not the only one who's crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you get to share your stories of thinking up this the room. This time with the maniacal laughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First of all, let me give you the uh, the URL in case you're not going to go to the show notes. I'll write this down, or maybe you can remember it, but it's growthbusters.groups.io slash g slash main. So that's why you need to go to the show notes. Cause it's, it's, <laughs> I'll go to the show notes. If you're 18, you might be able to remember what, What's the one word that you Google to get there? I don't know. I haven't checked that out yet. Oh, okay. I bet it might not be showing up in Google searches because it's largely 
been private and kind of hidden and subversive. And you uh, yeah, you can but happened. you can get a little bit of a glimpse of it. But then you have to apply to join. It doesn't cost you anything to join, but there is a a gate because most of what we're doing we want to be uh, sort of behind closed doors. We don't want people to be inhibited by it being completely out in public where the boosters out there might be coming and spying on us and trying to cancel us or uh, be one step ahead of some of the strategies and projects that we're discussing. So you have to apply to join and then we let you in. And, yeah, no trolls, please. And hopefully you're not a spy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, this is a brave new world we live in. Yeah, isn't it? But besides developing like some of these uh, fact sheets, these resources, we also, uh, like I said, we, I want people to be able to self-organize. So if somebody's got a good idea for a project, they can kind of present it here and see if there are enough other members of the community to pitch in and help to make that actually happen. And we've been kind of beta testing it with Chris and a few other people. And one idea I put out there was that I have a really, I think it's a really strong idea for a series of just 60 second public service announcements, videos that would, uh, you know, maybe find their way onto cable channels or streaming services, but definitely be on YouTube, which is a good place for them to go. And I could use some help developing the scripts for those and eventually maybe some help uh, doing a little bit of fundraising to fund the production. And so uh, a few people thought that was a good idea. So we've created a team to work on that. And Chris, you you joined the team. And not only did you join the team, but you wrote, I think in the First 13. week, yeah, thirteen scripts, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow, yeah, um, it's fun, yeah. And so, actually, he's been writing some scripts that are a little bit outside my concept, so they're no good. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, so now we almost have two projects in a way. Uh, but, but in this PSA team, we'll be working on uh, uh, figuring out a way to bring both of those to fruition because I think they have a lot of good. Potential. I think they have a profound impact because people have asked me, like, what turned you into an environmentalist? And I don't know if any of you guys remember this. There's this Native American dude that I saw in between <laughs> Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch when I was a kid. Well, the guy with and, one tear. And yeah, the sheet. one tear rolling down his eyes. He's looking at the Cuyahoga River on fire. People are throwing trash out of their cars. And it's like, people cause pollution. People can stop it. And there's this guy with a tear rolling. It's just, it was a public service ad on television. And that really moved me as a kid. It was a brilliant piece of propaganda that really worked well. It was propaganda because he wasn't really a Native American. He was Italian. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Remember the berm shade signs and that idea, too? Oh, that was yeah. another one we were thinking of. Oh, yeah. And that, that's Road just side. waiting for execution. It's got yeah. a great Tom Waits song about berm shave, yeah. titled Burma Shave. Oh, I'll have yeah. to check that out. So anyway, link in the show notes to this uh, online community. And like I said, we're opening it up to the public now. And Chris, you know, the beta test has been pretty limited. We've had about a dozen people in there. So it's going to be much more robust when we uh, double, triple, quadruple the membership. And uh, I anticipate we'll be over 100 members before you know it. But if you're one of those people who's worried about too much, you have a lot of control. You can really customize your notifications and whether you want to get email notifications, whether you want to get digest versus detail and and which subjects you want to hear about and which subjects you're not interested in. You can fine tune your experience in there to make it enjoyable. And it's fun. We have some nice interchanges. We point out, you know, neat things to read and just talk about great new ideas. Yeah. On this forum. And uh, so I'm glad you want to join. It'll be fun to have you there. And we're even doing, experimenting with a little bit of creating uh, some online events, uh, you know, some Zoom events from time to time. I think, Chris, you actually led one. Oh, we did one in August. Yeah. yeah. So we had a little Zoom event where we talked about Thomas Malthus. Yeah. And I thought that was great because I think a lot of people don't really know very much about Thomas Malthus. Pretty much most people, all they know is. Does he play hockey for the apps? Who is this guy? <laughs> No, it's just that if an idea is bad, it must be Neo-Malthusian. Right. Some people think he's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. I call myself a Neo-Malthusian, and I don't even know. Yeah. It, it means different things to different people. It's a lot more complicated. I don't think he was yeah. perfect, but I don't think he was the asshole that some people think. He, he, was, a, he, he was, was a philosopher. Yeah. It was a, so, um, yeah, that was a good forum. Good thing to start. It probed me to learn more about Malthus and to... Uh, have uh, you know to produce that talk? I think was very useful for me, and to find out that this word Malthusian has been misused. It isn't 
whatever they're talking about, it doesn't really have anything to do with the writing or the life of the guy that they're using. Yeah. If he was so wrong, we wouldn't be talking about him anymore. (laughs) He started this whole conversation, (laughs) you know. So, So. And so I'm doing the next one, actually, on uh, October 22nd. And the only way you're going to find out about it is if you join this online community where it's on the calendar. And I'm going to be talking about how we speak and write about overshoot subjects, what I have learned in 20 years of standing up in those meetings and (laughs) letting one rip and saying, Uh what was I thinking? (laughs) (laughs) What I've learned from experience, what I've uh, learned from uh, reading some suggestions from other experts. And then, and it's not just going to be a lecture. I'm going to try to keep that pretty short and have a discussion and find out what everybody else thinks they've learned about it. So we're just trying to be useful and help everybody up their game. It's this art of rhetoric, right? I mean, rhetoric was one of the fundamental disciplines going back to the ancient Greeks. And I think we say, oh, it's rhetoric and it's sort of a pejorative term. But knowing how to make your case in a way that wins hearts and minds is is rhetoric. And that's what I need help with. So I'm interested. Great. I'll sign up. We may lose Stephanie before we get to the end of this conversation. Do you have something specific that you want us to get to next to make sure that you get your say on it? No, I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation, and I'm happy to just see where it goes from here. And I want to ask Steph, why is Elon Musk pushing population growth? Do you have any sense of that? Well, he's poorly informed about <laughs> reality. <laughs> now, I mean, isn't it just astounding to you? Well, and I think he lives a very different life than... 7.9 billion people on the planet, and he, he just doesn't understand basic arithmetic, as far as I can tell, when it comes to what are the biggest challenges that our planet and humanity are facing, and what is realistic to solve those problems. I think he lives in a total, a different universe, apparently. That's my impression. I also think he likes attention. And he might be saying something that he knows is provocative, just so he can get the limelight. That's a good point. Do you have a theory? No, I'm baffled. I mean, obviously, he's not a stupid man. He's got to be pretty smart. Does he live in such a bubble, as as Steph is suggesting? Is there some ulterior motive that he has? Because he wants, I mean, if you go back into the roots of capitalism, there's a lot of early capitalists that suggested we needed poverty to make people work. He likes to have minions that are going to be working desperately to help us get to Mars. I mean, I saw a pair of sweatpants yesterday on a student at the University of Denver. It said, Mars is our future. (laughs) Oh, my. And I'm just like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 is that some meme that's growing that I'm unaware of? Do people really believe that? And, and I think Elon Musk is one of these Mars fantasizers. And I, I wonder if his statement is something about taking the light of consciousness beyond the domain of Earth or whatever. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think that's the way he thinks. You know, he's convinced people who have taken my population course. And I have to deprogram them a little bit. <laughs> but I think you're right. And the nail on the head was that, that Elon Musk is thinking just over all of our heads. He's thinking about spreading humanity to the rest of the universe, never mind what happens on Earth. I'll tell you what he's thinking. Ka-ching. That Ka-ching. 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 Yeah. Ka-ching. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the little riff on Upton Sinclair, I think, is that it's pretty difficult for a, a man to really grasp the truth when the value of his billion dollar portfolio depends on that not being true. He's just thinking about, you know, the billions he's going to make from SpaceX and space exploration. And But it's not going to happen, right? No, yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if we actually did grow the population, it just means we crash it harder and we get to the Thomas Hobbesian world that is nasty, brutish, and short that much faster. And there aren't going to be any iPhones. Or There's Teslas. not going to be any networks or yeah. Teslas. There's yeah. going to be sticks and stones. Yeah. Yeah, if you had you a pod, that math. if you had a podcast in which you discussed what kind of economy works when population is going down, because you talked to you know population is part of the whole growth economy on mm-hmm. which economists say population growth or growth in general, consumption growth, population growth, is necessary for stability of the economy. So the economy is a human construct. Can't we think of something that is still stable when population is going down? Well, we definitely need some serious tweaks to the economy for it to be healthy under those conditions, don't we, Paul? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things my students, they're pretty much buying that we need system change. 
but they want to know what the new system looks like. And I, I say, we have to envision that together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, but I, I, I think that's, that's a really good question. I mean, we've had Herman Daly and his steady state economy. We have the CAS people talking about a steady state economy, but actually a shrinking population is, is going to be even more different than that. So I'm going to learn that when I sign up for your tools is envisioning this, this different economic system. And uh, I'm ready to work with you guys on envisioning that because I don't have the answers to that yet. I mean, the first things you do is you, you stop subsidizing fossil fuels, right? You tax the super wealthy, right? Billionaires are obscene, right? You incentivize smaller populations, and maybe a geographic redistribution of them. Like We're just planning for, when I go to Dr. Cog meetings, it's a million more people in the Denver metro area by 2050. And they're planning on that. And the way they're dealing with it is more bicycling, more public transportation, more pedestrian-friendly stuff. And they know that the highways are going to get more crowded. And you're like, oh, but it's going to be more smoggy because cars idling produce more smog. They're counting on all those cars being electric. But they want to disincentivize vehicles. So, and the one variable that they're not examining. They're just assuming the million. They're, yeah. they're like, it's not our job to disincentivize population growth. But La Junta and Fort Morgan and the, the regional areas that don't have the demographic base to support a hospital, I think we should incentivize population growth there so that they, they at least have a demographic base to support hospitals out there. Um, if I can uh, bring up a slightly different subject here. We're not going to get any new policies or new ideas changed until we can elect people of like minds, right, that, they can, that are thinking differently and get into positions of power where they can actually have a seat at the table and become those people that are helping us make policy. You two have both run for office. You're in office. Dave, you ran for office, but uh, you were too honest. Yep. And uh, didn't make it in office. If you had to do it again, would you do things differently to get into that seat with the, where, in that room where you have a, a seat at the table? No, I wouldn't because it wouldn't be worth it to me. I had to be honest and find out whether I could be elected with that degree of honesty. Steph here is charming, attractive, eloquent. Uh, are you going to run for office soon? It, it could be in my future. I think that that would be... Something I I might a way in which I might be able to contribute. Well, in the I'll don't, donate wow. money to your That's campaign. Cool. You got will you will you right host here. a fundraiser for me, Paul? <laughs> yeah, it won't bring in that much money. My, my <laughs> friends, you know, they're all just wearing their Grateful Dead T-shirts. <laughs> show up. What you wanted money? I thought there was like free cheese. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you mentioned at lunch, Chris, that, you know, you almost have to tell the public what they want to hear to get elected and then hope that you can somehow get away with then doing the right thing, even though they didn't elect you, giving you permission to do the right thing. Yeah, I said that because I think that's what people do. They have to say what people want to hear because then people are comfortable with you and they vote for you. People ask me all the time, are you going to run again? I ran for city council in my hometown in 2009 and got 43% of the vote, which wasn't enough. But I was telling the truth, you know, that growth is the cause of our problems. It can't possibly be the solution to them. So I'm pretty sure if somehow I can eke out the time, I'm going to run for office again. I'm going to run for president of the United States in 2024. Really? Yeah. Woohoo! Awesome. Do I don't think Stephanie's picking that. <laughs> you, Are you just then, pulling on, our chain here? On the, on the podcast, you can't see our faces. I mean, we've got, I mean the, the amazing thing about the 2024 election, it looks like it's going to be Trump versus Biden. And all of America doesn't want either of them to run. I might have a chance. You might have a chance. Yeah, maybe so you could be the, the kingmaker. This is the year to do it. I mean, this is a year for a third-party candidate. But I think if you go down in flames, you might pull down the Democrat. Because I think you'd probably pull away more Democratic votes than Republican votes. Ah, so I'd be a spoiler. Yeah, That's the danger, right? Maybe you no, have to spoiler do, or kingmaker. At the you last have to minute, you can Democrat, throw your votes. Run as a Democrat and try to beat Biden, but that'd be rough business. But mainly, I'd vote know, for you. I'd donate to your campaign too. I would be for you running for some position in the state of Colorado because it seems like voters might actually be more amenable to an anti-growth message. And I think we were planning to talk about some of the yeah, survey statistics that support that idea. Yeah, let's dig into that. I think you brought that up too, Paul, didn't you? So it looked like this was done by 
the Rasmussen Reports and Numbers USA Education and Research Foundation in June. The long and short of it is a majority of Colorado voters seem to be worrying that Colorado is becoming too crowded. Um, And so some of these statistics that I thought were most interesting. 63% of Colorado voters want state and local governments to restrict development to make it more difficult for people to move to Colorado from other states. Majority, 53%, want the federal government to reduce annual immigration from other countries to slow down Colorado's population growth. 61% of Colorado voters believe the state has already developed too much. Only 8% think Colorado has developed too little. These are interesting numbers to me. Yeah, pretty significant. These are the people that would email you later and say, yeah, I didn't have the guts to say what you said. Paul. Yeah, but th- th- there weren't that many in that room of elected officials and uh, town staff. Yeah. That's the electorate at large. So what causes the disproportionate representation of pro-growth developer types at a Colorado Municipal League meeting? That reminds me of a great newspaper cover The Colorado Springs Independent, they had a great cover years ago, and the headline on it was, The Best City Council Money Can Buy. Oh, boy. Very disappointing. Where does the money come from? The growth boosters. Did you feel that when you ran for office? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't getting any of that. I never thought for a minute I would get any of the growth boosters' money, but the real estate development community made sure that my opponent, you know, was... And then, and then they can do getting on to local government, which I'm in now, by probably because I'm lucky I'm in a small town, I just have to talk to 10 people and I can win an election, is an education that's like a fire hose. It's just astounding. Like we have these tax incentive uh, financing where a developer can approach a town and say, annex me, change the zoning, and we'll build a bunch of commercial establishments. But I want 2% of the sales tax for 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. Right? To pay for the quote-unquote public improvements. That yeah, to pay to for those public improvements. And, to me, yeah. that is legalized corruption. And it's a growth-inducing corruption. Well, it's easy to get that in a, you know, in a world where everybody believes that growth is the answer to their problems. But you've got to wonder, wow, if over 60% of the public out there has had enough – Sounds like they have that maybe it's time for Dave Gardner to run for a state office. Yeah, but I want to run for president so that I can put out there a platform. It won't be too involved because I don't have that kind of time and I can't hire a bunch of people. But I want to at least be a good example to Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, whoever some of the future candidates might be, as to what you need to be honest with the people about and what kind of national projects we have. You know, right now, everybody's bitching and moaning about the price of gas, right? Have they gotten one word from Joe Biden saying, you know what, I feel your pain, but we really need to be burning a whole lot less of this gas. So let's make a national project of seeing how much less gasoline we can burn. Did you hear one word about that? No. It would be right to advocate for a higher price of gas. Higher price of gas means more of a deterrent to fossil fuel burning. And an incentive to drive a Nissan Leaf. (laughs) They're not ready. Yes, for incentive. When you're talking, I I, I just can't imagine anyone is ready to hear that, even though it's the truth and it needs to be said. No one is ready to hear that. So I figure it's highly unlikely I'm going to get elected. So what do I have to lose by... Once again, going out there and telling the God's honest truth. You got a point there. But why can't you do that in Colorado and and actually maybe get elected and have an ability to, to enact policy and start there and work and your way up? Take the Hickenlooper t- path to the presidency. You know, if, <laughs> if, if the only other choices are uh, are Biden and Trump, then <laughs> maybe I should go for the gold. Go for sure. the gold. I we'll support know. you either way, Dave. I'm a scientist. I'll vote for the person that speaks honesty. But you wouldn't necessarily advise the candidate to be that honest, right? Because you would be sure they would. I still prefer honesty. I was too cynical to say you have to say you know, what people are expecting you to say. I was being scientific in the sense that that's what the history is, uh, is telling us. But um, no, no, I'm always in favor of the honest. So let's truth. circle back to this um, survey about Colorado voters being ready for their 
elected officials to stop growth rather than pursue it. Is it because they've just had enough of the long commutes and the dirty air and uh, unaffordable housing? Or is it because they're starting to be scared because we're having some real honest coverage of the freshwater crisis in the American West? You know, the Colorado River can't go two days without seeing a new story about the dismal level of the reservoirs on the Colorado River and the big sacrifices that states and communities are being asked to to make in order to somehow keep water in that river and more and more honest coverage of climate disruption. Could it be that the people are recognizing that growth is a a shitstorm? I'm trying to cuss as many times as I can in this episode. (laughs) That's three so far, I think. Yeah. You're right. Running for president or whatever state office we encourage you to run for um, or congressman. I wouldn't mind if Colorado Springs got a new congressman. (laughs) It's a coalition. There are people like us that see the big global picture and think that that message is good. There are people that are stuck in traffic that are just self-absorbed and they wouldn't like to be stuck in traffic. There are people that sort of see the regional picture and the depleting Colorado River and they go, you know, that's going to make things harder in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. That's bad. So I think it's a coalition of people. Some people see it at all across the board, but I think some people see it globally. Some people see it only in their own personal world. So that would be my take on it. But it is interesting. Three out of five of them are like, I think I'm done with growth in Colorado. I don't think it's good for us anymore. That, I think, is the big take-home message. And in in your history of having done this, is this poll unusual? Are these results really different than stuff you've seen before? It doesn't surprise me to have a pretty good portion of the public complaining about growth. I don't even recall if I've ever seen a poll where they asked them, do you want your public officials to rein that in? Did they? I believe they had a question about population in there. And I think there was something of a disconnect in the responses because they said on average like 60% that they wanted less growth. They wanted less density. They wanted all the symptoms of high population to be dealt with somehow. But then when they're asked, uh, should we decrease the population of Colorado? No. Yeah, 31% want it to grow more slowly. 27% want the population to stay about the same. So that's over half of the people right there aren't in the camp of reducing the population. They're not in the growth camp. Okay. So what percent wanted it to actually shrink? There was a significant number. 32%. Yeah. So more than half wanted flat or down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, More than half wanted flat or up. And we should count that as a win. Yeah. (laughs) But I think people aren't ready yet. I guess 32% of the people may be ready yet to even envision a shrinking population. Most people just can't even imagine they're going to see that ever. The thing we're seeing here is that they're seeing the writing on the wall now. And I think you pointed out the Colorado River. I was just there this summer. I went to uh, Lake Powell and saw the 100-foot bathtub ring around that lake, which is down by 75%. Numbers are coming out that no longer can be ignored. They're seeing something coming. So I think that's what you're seeing in those uh, poll responses. Yeah, we're at the point where all of the news is really it's it's daily. It's it's starting to just hit us over the head. You know, 30 million people displaced in Pakistan because of insane amounts of monsoon rains. Puerto Rico, millions of people without power. Dominican Republic, a million people without fresh water. And th- this is all within a few days of each other. We're just getting hammered and hammered, and it's becoming so obvious that climate change is real. It's happening now. It's it's impacting millions of people. It's going to impact our communities. You know, maybe it's the the heat, the heat that everyone's experiencing every summer now. And a lot of people in Colorado don't have air conditioning, so it's getting uncomfortable. And it's you you can't deny it anymore. Yeah, it's getting harder to be in denial. And they must be feeling it in the prices of food, the prices of gas, prices of things. That's where people really feel things. And climate change will affect the cost of food production, so it will affect the cost of of food. And, of course, the cost of gas affects everything because the price of food and everything else is dependent on the price of getting things to where they have to be. That's what people feel. They they say, oh, you know, it's costing too much, and this is going to have some beneficial effects in that – Women are going to calculate that they need smaller families because they can no longer afford to have kids. Mm -hmm. 
And it's going to have some negative effects because people are going to get more aggressive with each other. I think we've seen that with, with the pandemic and the run on food on the shelves. And I, I think that those types of And the political instances, polarization that's happening here. Too. Yeah. It's like, oh, mm. wow, there might not be food in the grocery store one day. Or toilet paper. And I'm fighting with all these people that are around me. Yeah. It's interesting. Maryland, on the topic of air conditioning, you know, it, it's by law in many places that when you have rental property, you have to provide heating. Maryland has just made it the law that you now have to provide air conditioning because wow. heat waves are killing people now. I hadn't heard that. That's an interesting one. Affordable housing is a big uh, issue. Everybody's trying to figure out what to do about that. And there was just a Colorado Public Radio story sharing that Colorado Governor Jared Polis is hoping to figure out ways to incentivize local communities to uh, allow higher density development, infill development and higher density so that we can build residential housing faster and meet the needs of the population growth and do it fast enough that the cost of housing doesn't keep going up so fast. And uh, I mentioned to you guys at lunch that it reminded me of the state of California where communities are required to accommodate a certain percentage of population growth. And it sounds like Colorado might be headed that way if Jared Polis gets his way. When you know The, the truth is he didn't make any announcement about saying, hey, at, at the same time, why don't we stop uh, pursuing population growth. Let's stop subsidizing growth. Let's cut with the economic development incentives that are driving a lot of the growth into our communities. This place is popular enough. We do not need to be advertising it and pushing it. We, we know we can't slam the gates, but we can stop subsidizing growth. Didn't hear that. No. no. Uh, so I worry about what the future of Colorado might be if, you know, I don't want California to... There's some good things about California, but... Is it 50 million people in California? I think it's 40 almost? million. I don't think it's hit 50 yet. It's a beautiful substrate. But it's yeah. increasingly, uh, you know, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Yeah. Um, and it's on fire. And it's on fire. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I do think I need to say my farewell. I'm going to go on an intense hike now. Oh, the incline. The incline. Happy trails. Well, wish me luck. Enjoy sweating. <laughs> well, I hope your dad's a congressman or a governor someday. Or you. And you as well. <laughs> I could tell you more about my contraceptive vaccine. I just spoke at Denver University on this and uh, got some pretty good feedback from Paul's uh, class. And I, I presented the contraceptive vaccine idea, the background of it. The motivation for it is, of course, to decrease population. Birth rate is going down anyway. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't mention is the repertoire of contraceptives that are out there right now are not working. And about half of all Pregnancies are unintended, and these are leading to a lot of unintended births. And children that are born from parents that didn't want them often have a poor outcome in life. So this is going to uh, make every child a wanted child, better outcomes for children because they're going to have a loving mother that wanted to have them from the very start. Some good feedback I got from the students were, you know, oh, can you make it reversible? And I said, yes, I'm making it reversible. Is it long-term or short-term? I was reading into their faces that they were a little scared to get vaccinated for life against pregnancy. So we are working on a, a short-term vaccine. Well, that is a pretty young crowd. So, I mean, if you were talking to a, a bunch of 35-year-olds, you might Women not have Women getting that. their tubes tied, that's the most common form of birth control. It's because once they've had their family, a lot of women get a tubal ligation and then they're done. Yeah, and that's so unfair. That's just the... Because we don't have to do it. The yeah, it's so much easier for the guys. <laughs> yeah. You know, we should be stepping up. We get, we get our tubes tied too. Men do. Yeah. Right? Vasectomies. Yeah. Every man but should be But this will be easier that. than surgery. This will be just a yeah. shot. And But was there, um, you know, I would have guessed that there's some kind of stigma, a little bit of vaccine stigma out there. I, you know, early on talking about these things, I got stigma all over the place, even from people in the population <laughs> community. I don't want to mention any names, but they said to me, I wouldn't want to touch that one with a 10-foot pole because I mentioned the word contraception and vaccine in the same sentence. So that has changed. Somehow the idea is permeating and it's getting to be uh, more normalized. Hmm. The problem that we have to address in terms of unwanted pregnancy is, is a difficult one. A lot of it is teenage pregnancy. And so I still have a difficult narrative to overcome 
because what do you do when the woman is a minor? How do you convince the parents that their 12-year-old needs to get vaccinated against pregnancy? If you don't do that, you have babies the results of incest, babies the results of rape, statutory rape or otherwise. Or just babies the result of submarine races. Yeah, just normal <laughs> you know, park, underage parking. sex. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> You know, sex education has failed in this country. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and that happens. And that's a major portion of unwanted pregnancies that these are happening from these young women. So there's an unsolved problem here, and it's a sociological one, of how do you convince people to think about sex when their kid is only 12 years old. I have two girls. I wasn't thinking of – I was really bad at educating my girls at sex, so I, I sympathize with the dads out there. So, right. why, so why do you have four grandchildren? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my girls are both child-free. So, um, I mean, almost every parent out there wants to make sure that their daughter doesn't get pregnant. Too soon. Too soon, right. you know, before the age of – 20 in a lot of cases, depending on which side of the Mason-Dixon line you're on. You're <laughs> yeah. going to have to edit that We've out. Got it. For that. Yeah. You know, so wouldn't they embrace this? Uh, I guess I haven't backstop. done the market study to tell you one way or another. It's, it's just, I guess, a, a fear. There's, there's lots of ways that entrepreneurial things like this can fail. And one way is late in the game, there being a, a no market for something. And if we want to have the biggest effect, we want the teenage market somehow. Yeah, shoot, ending teenage pregnancies, that ought to be an easy... I can see the parents saying, ooh, I'm going to permanently vaccinate my child against getting pregnant. They're not, that's like no. killing your grandchildren. You know, It's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Right? It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, well, and they shouldn't sign up for that. I mean, every woman should. I'm not going to promote that. Right? Yeah. 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 For young women, it should be a temporary vaccine. Mm -hmm. What else? Any other surprising response you got from students during your week at DU? I had some really good responses across the board. At the uh, contraceptive vaccine forum, there was uh, what was a, a question of, can you just have a quick pill that undoes your your contraceptive effect? So we're, that's that was the goal. That's a lot easier than having to go into a clinic. Some of the problems in the world are with men not wanting their women to go get contraception. Mm -hmm. So if you can do it in any kind of clandestine way, you're going to empower women in those places. So this is one of those. Yeah. Just like take... to find a way to get those guys to wise up. That too. Nice. That's for the population media center people <laughs> to work on. Work on that culture shift. Yeah, which we, we sorely, sorely need. Paul, you're not going to COP this year? No, not going. The last COP inside the walls was disappointing. Outside at the protest was much more inspiring. Well, I am going to put a plug in for uh, Scientists Warning Europe. I help them by producing the uh, Planet in Crisis podcast for them. And they're uh, holding a series of virtual events called The Robe to COP27, and they usually have some pretty smart, interesting speakers. So. That was the best event I went to at COP26. That they, they was put the Scientists Warning Europe. That I went to that one, and I was like, and they were basically, they said, the people in the streets get it more than the people in here. They, mm. they said that at the conference. Yeah. Like people have no sense of the urgency or the seriousness of the situation. So I'll put a link in the show notes to the video of that event. It's worth watching for sure. Give us a good final sound bite to go out with each of you. Get out there and shine light on the darkness. Dave Gardner for president. Ooh, awesome. Very good. <laughs> and I'll just say uh, growth is the cause of most of our problems. It cannot possibly be the solution. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Stephanie is back in the studio. She survived her incline hike. How was that hike? It was pretty tough. I really quickly want to try to just wrap up this episode, but I do want to add just a few thoughts that I uh, didn't manage to get into the conversation. So number one, uh, you know, we talked about that survey of people in the state of Colorado who are fed up with growth. And uh, I really should have raised the question that some of you might actually be thinking or were thinking during that conversation. Why worry about population growth in the city or state where we live? Don't those people just settle in other cities, states, or countries if we don't welcome them in our own community? And then I just want to say about that, that uh, we can't have a sustainable world if it's full of communities that are engaged in unsustainable behavior. 
and have unsustainable goals. So my goal is to get rid of this growth addiction and all of the false narratives about the benefits of growth, uh, root them out of every community. Every community needs to be basically against growth. We all need to be embracing peaking population growth and contraction and contraction of consumption and the economy. And so it's not necessarily the the total number that I'm worried about when I'm welcoming citizens standing up against growth. They're standing up against growth subsidies. They're standing up against public policy that pursues growth in this, you know, really ill-informed quest for success and prosperity when that, that's not the result of that growth. Yeah, I think that's a good clarification. And another comment I wished I'd made was that uh, we were talking a little bit about densification of cities as as a solution to unaffordable housing. Nobody wants to be a- against affordable housing, and, and yet <laughs> we're going to have to admit to ourselves that a lot of policy prescriptions for this housing affordability issue do tend to subsidize growth. And in the big picture, long run, if housing is unaffordable, that actually will ultimately filter into human behavior. I think parents are less likely to have four or five or six kids if they're going to have to house all those kids after they grow up. Yep, it's a feedback. Kind of a hard, cold way of looking at it. Yeah, it's a feedback. Yeah. Feedback yeah. loop. It is. So So unaffordable housing is a signal to us. Uh, it's letting us know, hey, you guys have overdone it. In the words of Herman Daly, growth has become uneconomic. But that's not to say that we shouldn't have, uh, you know, compassion for everybody and try to find a way to have a roof over everyone's head. But densification is uh, touted as a good sound response to climate change. It's a good way to shrink the per capita carbon footprint. In a lot of ways, it is, but there are some downsides to densification. You know, we need to be living in nature. We need to not forget nature. And the more we pack ourselves into these concrete jungles, the less nature we see. And we tend to forget nature and stop appreciating nature. And that kind of sends our behavior in the wrong direction. We get less quiet and solitude in these dense urban cities. And quiet and solitude is something that human beings value and we need. And uh, probably number one on my list is if you're listening to the Rolling Stones in a real dense urban environment, you cannot turn the volume up to 11. Ha ha ha. (laughs) I wonder how many listeners get that, get that reference. I was beginning to think you didn't. (laughs) Oh, I'm a big Spinal Tap fan. (laughs) Okay. All right, good. As we do wrap up, I want to remind you to hit the show notes for links to that Growthbusters campus tour we talked about and the new Growthbusters online community. If you want to bring a speaker like Paul Sutton, Chris Bystroff, Dave Gardner, or several of the other speakers that you can actually read about at the link to the Growthbusters campus tour, at that link you can find out how to contact Nicole, our amazing staffer, who I want to give a shout out to. She's coordinating both of these projects, the online community and the the campus tour. So Nicole, thanks so much for your partnership in this. Are you ready, Stephanie, for Honey, I Shrunk My Footprint? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, who's first? Well, I can go first. I thought I would just follow up on the the whole wedding thing that just happened, <laughs> which was the big reason okay, why we, we, we weren't podcasting for the last couple months because I was busy planning a bunch of events and you were busy planning a specific event because I asked you to host one of them at your house, which you graciously did. So it kept both of us quite busy. You planned one heck of a wedding. It was an amazing event. It was so special. It was really, really special. Um, and I did use several tools to try and and make sure that the wedding, which obviously was going to have a footprint, it was not going to be possible unless maybe having a Zoom wedding. But I did try and be conscientious and minimize the impact along the way. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things. One was we were able to compost food scraps from uh, several of the events during the weekend and, and in large part because you reached out to several composting organizations in Colorado Springs and asked around for who would be willing to take our compost and created some signs to label things. And the, luckily our caterer at the uh, wedding reception was amenable to 
composting leftover food. Uh, and then we were also able to take home leftover food from all of our events over the weekend. None of that was thrown away. So that was a huge deal. And one other thing that was kind of special to me was I was able to get flowers locally sourced from a family friend who has been doing a a flower business the last few years and she's been growing that business. She does not certified organic, but definitely sustainable farming practices and shout out to Ellen (laughs) doesn't use dyes and preservatives and all kinds of chemicals. So we were actually able to compost the flowers afterward too. Um, And uh, if you're local to Colorado Springs, she sells flowers at farmer's markets and bouquet subscriptions and it's Ellen's flowers. If you want to look that up. So just was going to highlight those few things. <laughs> there were more. but So thanks for all the effort that you put into trying to keep the footprint as small as possible. It shouldn't be such hard work, huh? Yeah, you, you would hope that in a, such a large industry with millions of weddings happening every year that it would be easier. And just the status quo or the default for vendors to offer more sustainable options and practices. Yeah. And then we do an episode about more sustainable weddings. You've done two episodes, which I had not listened to. So I actually went back and listened to those. And I looked at the resources that the Center for Biological Diversity has. Um, I looked at those, which were awesome. Maybe we can link to those in the show notes as well. Well, thanks for doing that. So here's mine. Mine's an interesting one. You may every now and then in an episode hear uh, the howls of a cat in the background. We have an aging cat. 19 or 20 years old, and uh, she is our last pet here in the house, and we are not going to replace her. And I'm putting that forward as a footprint shrinking thing because I've been long thinking about this that seems like, especially here in the U.S., maybe it's a worldwide thing, but our obsession with pets, it seems like that's uh, maybe a luxury that we can't afford when we're so deep into overshoot. What is the footprint of all those dogs and cats? And certainly if a young couple is deciding to have a dog instead of a child, that's going to reduce their footprint. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. <laughs> that, dog's not buying, that dog's not buying plane tickets or uh, driving a sports car. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> but there's this another uh, deeper decision, which might be not to have a pet. And it's interesting. This just kind of came across my desk the other day, even though it's actually a 2017 study that was done. And uh, it was called The Truth About Cats and Dogs Environmental Impact. And I was pretty stunned at what these researchers found, that U.S. cats and dogs cause 25 to 30% of the environmental impact of meat consumption in the U.S. What? 25 to 30%. Whoa, that's shocking to me. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, feeding pets creates the equivalent of 64 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. It's... uh about the same climate impact as a year's worth of driving from 13.5 million cars. Hmm. If you're into stats, the American diet produces the equivalent of 260 million tons of carbon dioxide from livestock production. The nation's dogs and cats eat about 19% as many calories as the nation's people. So we know the way we feed ourselves is a huge part of the climate disruption problem. Well, pets are a huge part of that part. Interestingly enough. That's really surprising to me. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. The truth about cats and dogs. (laughs) That was a good movie. (laughs) (laughs) It was, wasn't it? Okay. That's enough unless you've got any final thoughts, Stephanie. I just am glad to be back in the studio and looking forward to more podcasting. Be sure to check out growthbusters.org so that you can donate to keep the uh, podcast running, uh, find other episodes of the podcast or links to other good information to educate yourself about true sustainability. We want to thank Jake Fader and Carlos Jones for the awesome theme that you're about to hear as we wrap up. Thank you, Stephanie, for your partnership. You're doing an awesome job. We're getting lots of good comments about you being a good co-host for the podcast. I appreciate you doing this. Oh, gosh, I'm blushing. (laughs) Well, thanks, Dad, for being our leader on the podcast. And uh, always a pleasure to have these conversations with you. Thanks. We'll see you soon. We won't make you wait that long. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more. 
but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters. 